<laughs> there are better ones, but you'll have to read the book to get to this. Right? And, and the book, as, as was mentioned, is called Abraham Lincoln, A Life. Be sure to buy it. You don't have to read it, but be sure to buy it. Um, it's available for sale after this event. Um, now, enough levity. Let's get down to serious business here. What new of, of real significance can be said about Abraham Lincoln, um, and particularly his Illinois years? Well, one of, this, one of the startling new discoveries I made was that Lincoln um, was, was to identify over 200 articles that I'm pretty sure Lincoln wrote for the Illinois State Journal and its predecessor, the Sangamo Journal, the Springfield newspapers. And it was well known that Lincoln had written many articles for this newspaper. William Herndon, his law partner, said that Lincoln and I used to write for the paper all the time. And as far as I know, nobody had tried to identify the items that Lincoln had written. So I took a crack at it, and I have uh, identified what I'm pretty sure are at least 200 articles that Lincoln wrote. And these are, these are satirical pieces, uh, oftentimes written under a pseudonym, and which are uh, pretty low road. They're, they're very little, there's no Gettysburg Address, there's no second inaugural in those, these articles. And one of the striking features of these articles is how they engage in ridicule and sarcasm and put downs of Democrats. Lincoln, as you doubtless know, was a Whig, and he specialized in ridiculing and humiliating Democrats, both on the podium, that is in, in debate, and in, in writing. Um, and one of the more dismaying uh, discoveries was that in 1836 and in 1840, Abraham Lincoln, if I'm right in identifying these as his, Abraham Lincoln engaged in pretty significant race baiting. That is to say that he urged the voters of Illinois not to vote for Martin Van Buren for president. Van Buren was the Democratic candidate in 1836 and 1840 because he had supported limited black suffrage in the 1821 New York Constitutional Convention. Now that was a standard Whig argument. But Lincoln, if I'm right in identifying these materials as his, emphasized that over and over and over and over again. And uh, we, we know from Lincoln's collected works, there's, there's one item that is reproduced in that standard reference work of Lincoln's writings in which that argument is made. But if I'm right, he made it many, many times. Um, and so what are we to make of this? Why was Lincoln engaged in race baiting? Well, it was, as I say, it was a common practice in the day. Uh, and the Democrats engaged in race baiting, too. They argued that the Whig candidates were soft on slavery and soft on blacks. Um, so that raises the whole question of, of Lincoln and race. Another discovery I made was in the Frederick Douglass papers at the Library of Congress. Everybody who like, writes about Lincoln and race cites a speech that Frederick Douglass gave in 1876 in which he said that Abraham Lincoln was preeminently the white man's president. Preeminently the white man's president. And I um, knew that speech well. And I was going through the Frederick Douglass papers at the Library of Congress and discovered some speeches in his handwriting uh, which weren't published as part of the five-volume edition of Frederick Douglass's speeches that the Yale University Press had published recently. And the most startling speech was one that Frederick Douglass delivered on June 1st, 1865. He delivered it at Cooper Union in Manhattan, the premier spot in the country to give an important public utterance. And in that speech, Frederick Douglass says, Abraham Lincoln was preeminently, I'm, I'm sorry, Abraham Lincoln was emphatically the black man's president. Emphatically the black man's president. And I found this quite startling because it was such stark contrast to the speech that he gives in 76 where he says he's preeminently the white man's president. So uh, I double checked in the five volume edition of the Yale Press's version of Douglas' speeches and it's not there. So I wrote to the people at Yale and I said, why didn't you include this speech? I got no response. Uh, I, I phoned them, I left a message, no response. Well, those of us who went to Princeton aren't surprised that Yale conducts itself this way, but uh, what can I tell you? Um, and also in this speech, Frederick Douglass goes on to say that Abraham Lincoln was the first American president to rise above the prejudice of his time and his country. The first American president to recognize the rights of blacks and would respect their rights as men and citizens. He was the first American president to invite 
a black man to the White House to consult on public policy. He invited me twice. And by inviting me, Douglas says, he was saying to the country, I am the president of the black people as well as the white people. And I mean to respect their rights as citizens and men. Then <clears throat> I continued to work in the Frederick Douglass papers and I found another speech that Douglass gave, this time later in 1865. And this too was omitted from the speeches that were published by the Yale University Press. And in this speech, Frederick Douglass said, uh, that when Abraham Lincoln gave his last speech on April 11th, 1865, which of course he didn't know was going to be his last speech, Fred, uh, Abraham Lincoln called for black voting rights, that is to say, for those who had served in the Union Army and those who were very intelligent, by which we assume he meant the literate. And Douglas said that when Lincoln made that speech on April 11th, 1865, this was two days after Robert E. Lee surrendered, I and several of my abolitionist friends failed to appreciate how important that speech was. We were disappointed in it because the scope of the proposal was so limited. Just veterans of the Union Army and the very intelligent. But we should have recognized that Abraham Lincoln was making a profoundly important statement on that April 11, 1865 event. Because Abraham Lincoln learned his statesmanship in the school of rail splitting. And to split a rail, you take a wedge, and you insert the thin edge of the wedge into the log. And having done that, you take the a maul, a large hammer, and you drive home the thick edge of the wedge. And we should have known that once Abraham Lincoln inserted the thin edge of the wedge into the log, that he could, he could be counted on to drive home the thick edge of the wedge. And Douglas could cite Lincoln's treatment of slavery. Lincoln in 1861 inserts the thin edge of the wedge into slavery. He, calls, he drafts a bill for the Delaware State Legislature to pass that would free the slaves of Delaware and the federal government would compensate the slaveholders. He tries to get the Delaware State Legislature to adopt it, working behind the scenes. They won't do it. Then in early 1862, he makes an address to Congress in which he calls for Congress to pass legislation compensating slaveholders not only in Delaware but Maryland, Missouri, and Kentucky, the other border states that were loyal, slave states that were loyal to the Union. Th those slave states do not bite. Then he issues the Emancipation Proclamation, which frees the slaves, or, or he announces that he's going to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing the slaves in the Confederate states that were still in resistance. Um, that's in 1862. Then in the beginning of 1863, he promulgates that. And so the wedge is going deeper into the log. Then in, but it only covers slaves in Confederate areas still in resistance, still in rebellion. Then in 1864, he emphatically endorses the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery everywhere. In Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri, and, and occupied areas of, of Louisiana and Virginia as well. So you could see the thin edge of the wedge getting driven in and the thick edge of the wedge goes through. Now, in that audience on April 11th, 1865, there was somebody who did fully appreciate the significance of Lincoln's call for black suffrage. And that was a young, charismatic actor named John Wilkes Booth. And when he heard Lincoln call for limited black suffrage, John Wilkes Booth turned to his companions and said,